negotiations at the table for two of these big three car companies. Yeah, so Ford, as you point out, one of the three doing much better, according to the union, than the other two. The union saying they made a lot of progress with Ford, but they still have a lot of ground to cover. Ford basically acknowledging that uh, GM and Stellantis, the union says, still have a lot sort of a longer way to go in these contract talks. They are still much farther apart as far as their demands versus the offers. But we should point out pretty much uh, at least Ford and GM pretty immediately uh, once the president was on his way to the Detroit area saying that these talks remain between the companies and union members, basically saying politics, meaning these two visits today and tomorrow, are not going to have any impact. So we'll see if that's indeed true. Allie. Maggie Vespa live for us there in Michigan, really uh, quite literally in the thick of it. Maggie, thank you. David Noriega is live for us in Los Angeles in the middle of it from a uh, different perspective, if you will, David, because we've got this one strike that looks to be wrapping up. That's the writers. But another that looks to be expanding with actors and now maybe video game actors. How long could that stretch on? What's it looking like from the experts and the folks that you're talking to out there? So that's right, Hallie. Video game actors voted overwhelmingly to authorize a strike. That doesn't mean a strike is going to happen. It just means that SAG, the union, is now authorized to call a strike if it comes to that in the negotiations. That would pertain to a labor contract for the kind of acting that goes into video games, motion capture, voice acting, that sort of thing. That would be in addition to the already ongoing and very big strike for that actors have been on since July. That's against the TV and movie studios and the streamers. That's the sort of conventional movie and TV acting that you know we're all familiar with. As far as what's happening on that front. Right now there's a feeling of hope actually, pretty high hopes that there's solid momentum and that the fact that there's, uh, that we're very close to a final deal with the writers, that that means that the actors will get a deal of their own because the idea is that if the studios were willing to sit down with the writers and reach a solid deal, they'll be willing to do the same with the actors and to do so pretty quickly. Holly. There's also this piece of it. When you talk about momentum, David, you look at what's happening out in Vegas with the potential for that big union. And, uh, you know, I know it because it has a political importance, too, when it comes to the state of Nevada, potentially voting to green light a strike. I wonder when you come, when you, we have this moment in a state like California, solidly blue, in a state like Nevada, obviously more purple. Uh, give me a sense of the way that people are engaging with the labor movement right now? Is it something you're hearing a lot about? Are people talking about it? Give us a sense of what it's like. Yeah, so it's not just that. You know, one that doesn't get talked about very much is here in L.A., hotel workers have also been on mm. strike off and on all summer. And they're back on strike. Some of them are back on strike at certain properties in Santa Monica as of yesterday. Now, the interesting thing with the, the writer's strike, the fact that that strike is ending in the way in the way that it appears to be ending has huge reverberations not just for the entertainment industry which we can talk about but for organized labor in general and the writers are very conscious of that they, they think explicitly of their labor action as being connected to all of these labor actions across the country and across industries including industries that we don't think of as being related to entertainment at all mm -hmm. right so even though the writers have called off their official their unions picket lines they're actually still out on the picket lines in support of their colleagues the actors who are still on strike. And we went out to one of the picket lines today to talk to the writers about some of these bigger picture labor questions. Here's what one of them had to say. Do you have a message for people in other industries that are striking, auto workers, hotel workers, etc.? Uh, they're going to try to gaslight you and tell you that you're being unreasonable, that you know they can't do it, they can't afford it. But uh, I think you've seen from what we did that everybody is with you and uh, keep standing strong and eventually you will get what you deserve. So as far as what's next, Hallie, uh, you know, the uh, WGA leadership needs to approve this deal. That's expected to happen today. Then they have to send the deal to the full membership, all 11,500 members of the union for them to approve the deal. What I hear from writers is that this is a union that's pretty democratic. There isn't much daylight between the union leadership and the rank and file. So the rank and file pretty much expects that they're going to like this deal, that they're going to sign it. That's going to be a big step forward for the entertainment industry, for Hollywood to kick back into gear. But obviously, as we heard from this writer, this means that they want other workers to be inspired by this and to realize that at this moment strikes can work Hallie we had talked about David the reverberations there right for the strike and how that would affect the entertainment industry writ large and as you lay out that is what we're seeing David Noriega I'd be remiss if I did not welcome you officially to NBC this is your first appearance as our newest correspondent we're thrilled to have you are you having the best time of your life yet best time of my life Hallie we'd love to hear it David thank you we'll see you soon look thank forward you. to it appreciate it so listen, in just the last couple of minutes back here in Washington, we are getting a sighting of newly indicted Senator 
Bob Menendez, as he's showing up on Capitol Hill for the first time since federal prosecutors charged him in a bribery scandal. You know, you can see it. He is surrounded by reporters. Listen to what they asked and what he did not answer. Senator Menendez, why aren't you resigning? No comment from the senator in just the last five or six minutes there. That coming into us fresh from our team on Capitol Hill, as we are also seeing a big 180 from his colleagues in the last 24 hours. 17 more Democratic senators, you see them here, now calling on Menendez to resign. That number was just two when we came on the air here yesterday. Now, look at that. This is more than a third of all Senate Dems, including the most high profile so far. The other senator from New Jersey, this guy, Cory Booker. He's represented that state alongside Menendez for the last decade. And Booker's getting some backup. Listen. The American people deserve a government they can, they can trust. They deserve that they are not questioning whether their elected leaders are working for the people or for themselves. And in light of that lack of trust, um, I share Senator Booker's views that he should step down. Remember, it was just yesterday that Senator Menendez said publicly he has no plans to do that. He does not intend to step down. Keep in mind, he didn't say anything about running for re-election or not. NBC's Saha Kapoor is following this for us tonight. Kind of a moment here in the last 20 minutes or so over on Capitol Hill with Senator Menendez showing up now for the first time back on the Capitol after this indictment came down. The second indictment, right, different than the first he faced several years ago, ended in a, mis uh, a hung jury, if you will. Now he's facing this sort of new bribery scandal. And he's not saying much, at least to the Capitol Hill press corps. He delivered that news conference we saw 24 hours ago, but really hasn't said anything about the reelection piece or this new pressure on him to step down. That's right, Hallie. The dam has broken. More and more Senate Democrats are calling on Senator Menendez to resign, even as he remains defiant, insists he's not going anywhere, says these charges, you know, the, the calls for him to resign are premature. Democrats are not listening to him. They say the standard for being a senator is higher, that he needs the trust of his constituents, and he has simply lost that. They all agree that he uh, deserves a, the presumption of innocence until proven guilty, but they do believe, uh, many of these members, that he should step aside. The latest Democrat to call on uh, Menendez to resign is Gary Peters of Michigan. This is significant because he's the chair of the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee, who's in charge of getting members elected and re-elected. Uh, Menendez, based on this statement, might not be able to rely on much help from the Senate campaign arm if he does decide for, to run for re-election, which, of course, he has not done. Uh, Peters, in a statement, said, quote, as elected officials, the public entrusts us to serve in their best interest and in the best interests of the country. He says Menendez deserves a fair legal process, but he's no longer able to represent effectively in the United States Senate, and as a result, he should resign. Now, one thing that senators are not talking about at this moment is a break glass option. The Senate can, under the Constitution, expel members. It almost never happens. It requires a two-thirds majority. It has not happened since the 1860s, since the Civil War, when members were uh, expelled for aiding the Confederacy, Hallie. That is not a conversation that's happening at the moment. We'll see where this goes. On the left side of the screen, we've seen, of course, Senator Menendez coming back to the Capitol. We talked about Senator Cory Booker, obviously a partner to Senator Menendez in New Jersey in the Senate uh, for years now, coming out and calling on his colleague to step down. That carries some weight. You've also got the top Democrat in the Senate, Chuck Schumer, who has I think, conspicuously not echoed the calls by those 17, 18, 19 of his colleagues. At, Walk us through that dynamic here, right, and the importance of what the Senate Majority Leader um, either will or won't say and how that plays into this. Yeah, his uh, decision on this, his opinion, I, I should say, on this is going to be very important. I'm talking, yeah. of course, about Chuck Schumer. He's the majority leader. He's only said so far that Menendez will step off his chairmanship of the powerful Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He's required to do that under the bylaws of the Democratic Conference. But he still has his committee assignments. You know, he's still a voting member of the mm -hmm. Senate. Now, can he be effective uh, when so many of his colleagues no longer trust him to serve? Uh, to be effective, you need allies. You know, you need people to co-sponsor your bills. You need committee chairs to hold hearings on your issues. You need them to vote for, your, you know, your proposals on the floor of the chamber. And uh, increasingly, it looks like Menendez will have a tough time doing that. Cory Booker's statement was very significant. These two have a close working relationship. They've yeah. served together for many years. Booker was initially silent on it. Uh, let's show what Booker said. It's on the screen there. Quote, as New Jersey's junior senator, I imagine that I've had more professional experiences with him than most others. I believe stepping down is best for those Senator Menendez has 
spent his life serving. It was a long statement, a nuanced statement. Everyone's saying, as is Booker, that he deserves a presumption of innocence, but they're saying he does not deserve the presumption of remaining a senator while fighting these very serious charges. Hallie. Sahil Kapoor, live for us there on Capitol Hill. Lots of action tonight, Sahil. We'll check back in with you, I know, in just a little bit. Appreciate it. Some other developing news here. In just the last few minutes, Baltimore detectives are announcing they're looking for an armed and dangerous man, 32-year-old Jason Billings Lee, because they think he's connected to the death of a tech CEO who was found on Monday with blunt force trauma injuries. That's how police describe it. Officials say Pava LaPair was discovered in her apartment. Police responded there shortly after she was reported missing. LaPair was the CEO of a company called Ecomap Technologies, which says it works to, I'm quoting here, make the information around us more accessible one ecosystem at a time. She was on Forbes' 30 under 30 list this year, earning a spot for her company's positive social impact. And obviously now this search happening as we speak in Baltimore. We're going to have more on this story as it develops a little bit later on here on this network. Also developing tonight, Amazon getting hit with a huge, big, new antitrust lawsuit tonight. That's because U.S. officials say Amazon's a monopoly. They say it's anti-competitive. They say that that makes the experience of people shopping on Amazon worse. And it stops Amazon's competitors, they allege, from lowering prices. Now, Amazon, you might be not surprised to hear, is pushing back on this. It's not the first time they faced accusations like this. But this time, Amazon's going to be going up against the federal government. Here's Jake Ward. Tonight, the Federal Trade Commission calling Amazon a monopoly that blocks out competitors and prevents them from lowering prices, costing you money. According to an antitrust lawsuit filed by the FTC in 17 other states, Amazon, quote, violates the law not just because it's big, but because it prevents current competitors from growing and new competitors from emerging. Amazon firing back, saying in a statement that the FTC has, quote, radically departed from its mission of protecting consumers and competition and that the result of the suit will lead to higher prices and that it looks forward to making that case in court. That means we could be moving towards another massive head-to-head -head legal battle as the Department of Justice is in the middle of another antitrust trial with Google. The latest coming out of that courtroom today shedding light on the deals Google made with other tech giants, Samsung and Apple, helping it solidify its search dominance. Google says it competed for those deals. The bold lawsuits should come as no surprise to anybody listening to the rhetoric from the president, who's been pushing for antitrust action. And prevent big online platforms from giving their own products an unfair advantage. In the last few years, U.S. regulators also suing Meta and Microsoft. It's a high watermark for antitrust action since the Department of Justice's historic monopoly settlement with Microsoft two decades ago. Microsoft was back in court today. The government then accusing Microsoft of preventing consumers from easily choosing competing software, like then-popular Netscape, eventually put out of business by Microsoft's Internet Explorer. Microsoft agreed to open up in the settlement, which many experts say helped lead to an era of greater competition. Newer products like Google Search, Amazon's early marketplace, and Facebook emerge. Ironically, the very companies the government is going after now. So how does today's suit impact you? The FTC alleges Amazon engages in anti-competitive conduct in multiple ways. By biasing its search results so Amazon products are seen over others that Amazon knows are of better quality, according to the FTC. By punishing sellers that offer discounts across the Internet, burying them so far down that they become effectively invisible. And by charging sellers costly fees. Amazon controls as much as 50% of the online retail market, according to a House Judiciary report from 2020. But the FTC's case could be an uphill climb. Those suits against Meta and Microsoft, a defeat and a dismissal. Something not lost on former FTC Commissioner Moselle Thompson. If you're not successful in prosecuting, it actually sends the opposite message. And so that's going to be a challenge because in this case, there are some positive features that Amazon provides to people, and I'm sure they're going to raise them, that positive benefits to consumers. Jake is joining us now. Um, listen, Jake, scope and scale of this, this is significant here. And what's so interesting is that Lena Khan, who's, of course, the head of the FTC, um, this has been a topic that she has been interested in for years, ever since she was a law student back at Yale. That's right. I mean, you, Hallie, you are hitting it right on the head, right? Not only is antitrust the lifeblood of what made her famous, what really made her famous was a, a, a paper she wrote as a law student in Yale specifically about Amazon. She wrote at the time that our old standards of using just price and output to gauge harm to consumers was not adequate to the current tech landscape that we are in. And then she specifically <laughs> analyzed Amazon and said that because this company is actually incentivized not to think as much about price as it does about growth, and that as it 
has grown as a platform. Its various things have come together. Its lines of business have come together and created what she said could be conditions for real predatory pricing. This is truly like flowing right out of her brain and into possible real law. The question, of course, is whether this string of defeats that she has faced at the FTC over the last few months means she's facing an uphill battle here or whether she may actually be able to set down some landmark new law that could seek to regulate tech in a whole new way, Hallie. Jake Ward, fascinating stuff. Thank you so much. Uh, keep us posted on how this one development develops. Appreciate it. Let's talk about the Supreme Court handing a big loss to Alabama Republicans now for the second time and making a new move that could help Democrats flip what might end up being a key House seat. That's because the justices have rejected the state's push to try to use a new congressional map that has only one majority black district. One of the lawyers who helped challenge the maps says today, and I'm quoting here, Alabama's open defiance of the Voting Rights Act stops today. If a new map ends up getting drawn with a second majority black district, it could help Democrats in their push to take back the House. I want to bring in Supreme Court reporter Lawrence Hurley. So in its most sort of simple, boiled down terms, a win, right, for voting rights advocates and a loss for the Alabama Republicans who wanted to see something different on this map. Yeah, and the, the Republicans didn't get much more traction this time than they did three months ago. The Supreme Court literally just ruled in a big case back in June that reaffirmed the key parts of the Voting Rights Act that, you know, they couldn't do this. They had to draw a district, basically, that uh, allows black people to elect uh, the representative of their choosing. And uh, the, the state went back, drew a new map that still doesn't do that, and then went back to the Supreme Court to say, OK, well, how about now? Uh, and the Supreme Court said, no, this time there was no dissent. Uh, you know, the, it was just a brief court order. So now the state's back to the drawing board again. It's now going through the courts, and there probably will be a map now with two districts that black people will be able to vote their ele elected representatives for. How should we be thinking about this decision here and this set of cases in the broader context of the way that the Supreme Court has been looking at the Voting Rights Act and at voting rights issues? Well, I think one of the things it shows is that um, there are some Republicans now who think that because the Supreme Court has a 6-3 conservative majority, that anything they say will go. And I think what we've been seeing a little bit, not just in voting cases, but in other cases too, is that this Supreme Court is very conservative, but there are some places it's not going to go to, at least not yet. Uh, there's this whole question about uh, race-neutral kind of approaches to the law, which they embraced in, when they struck down affirmative action. But, you know, in this case, they weren't willing to do that. Lawrence Hurley, thank you so much for that reporting. Good to see you. We are just getting some new news out of the White House here as we're learning that President Biden's dog has bitten somebody else. The Secret Service says that last night an officer came into contact with Commander, that's the pup, and was bitten. Remember, it was just a couple of months ago that the conservative group Judicial Watch released a report that says Commander has had 10 what they call biting incidents in just over a year. I want to bring in Kelly O'Donnell, who's live for us at the White House. And Kelly, listen, there has been a lot of attention on Commander the dog. Lots of issues in Washington, but this is one that, you know, people are talking about. Well, you and I are both dog lovers, and so this is something that has always been of interest. Uh, and you can understand that when there is a family pet who is also the type of breed, a German Shepherd, that is sort of in its DNA to have the guarding uh, sort of sensibility, there have been problems here. And this is certainly difficult for uh, the first family and also any of the personnel who have been bitten and needed treatment. Let's remember, there have been some injuries from this. So what occurred last night was about 8 o'clock, one of the uniform division. So those are the members of the Secret Service who appear to be wearing a police-type uniform. The uniform division tends to guard the place, whereas agents guard the people. And there was some kind of encounter with uh, Commander Biden, who was about two years old. There was a bite. The bite was treated. The woman officer uh, was treated here on the grounds of the White House. There is the medical unit, of course, as you know, Hallie. And this puts pressure on the uh, first family because this pet uh, is not handled by the Secret Service, not walked by the Secret Service. And anyone who considers the White House workplace their place of business, of course, needs to be safe from any risk here. So it's complicated. The White House, uh, through the First Lady's office, says that they have acknowledged this before that this can be a stressful environment for this dog and the president and the first lady are trying to create safe spaces where commander can play and roam and uh, not have any of these unpleasant encounters. Uh, at the same time, there is a track record here now where this dog has had several biting incidents over the last couple of years. Hallie? Kelly O'Donnell live for us there on the White House North Lawn. Kelly, thank you.
Some other news just coming into us here. A New York judge now ruling that former President Donald Trump committed fraud and lied about his net worth for years. And according to the court documents just into us, Mr. Trump apparently, according to this judge, lied to banks and insurers, exaggerating his net worth to the tune of something like billions of dollars. This is all ahead of a civil trial that is set to begin on Monday. I want to get right to Tom Winter. Explain what the judge is saying here and its significance. Right. So the judge is basically saying that the attorney general for the state of New York, Letitia James, came forward with a civil complaint last year and said that the former president, through his businesses and his personal financial representations, committed fraud by overstating his personal wealth and the wealth of uh, uh, his properties, uh, how much his properties are worth, uh, even the square footage in a now famous or infamous example uh, that the attorney general's office said where Trump uh, multiplied the square footage of his Trump Tower apartment by three, from 10,000 to 30,000 square feet, to put a certain price on it uh, to include in, a, in his statement of financial conditions. The judge saying here today that he agrees with the attorney general that, in fact, Trump, his companies, et cetera, have committed fraud here. Now, the remaining question for a trial, it's going to be a bench trial that's slated to happen in October, Hallie, is just how much the Trump Organization and Donald Trump and some of his kids will have to disgorge, basically give back to the state of New York uh, for committing this fraud. So that's a significant question, among some others, uh, that will likely come up and have to come up at this trial. In addition to that, he fined $7,500 to each of Donald Trump's attorneys uh, for continuing to bring up arguments, he says, that he has previously ruled on, that the appellate courts in the state of New York, the first appellate division has made rulings on and continue to say and suggest that the attorney general cannot bring these types of charges or, or suit, rather, uh, and on top of that, uh, cannot continue to make some of the arguments. So uh, the judge here pretty solidly uh, condemning the uh, Trump organization and the former president. We'll have to see what happens at trial, Hallie, and just how much money potentially the former president has to put forward. Tom Winter, thank you very much for that sure. breakdown. Lots going on tonight. Appreciate it. Also learning tonight that while the new COVID shot is available coast to coast, its rollout hasn't exactly been super smooth. You've got a lot of people reporting problems with getting insurance to cover this vaccine. Without it, it could cost upwards of 100 bucks. So let's just say that part goes smoothly, that insurance does pay for it. You've also got people saying they can't even get an appointment to get the shot because there's been a, an issue with supply, right? Getting it to the places where it needs to go to be distributed. I want to bring in Dr. Natalie Azar here. Part of this, right, seems to be the shift in the way that the shot is getting distributed, that this vaccine is getting distributed to the places where you or I might go to get the vaccine. Talk right. us through it and what the, the bigger implications of this are. Well, I mean, Hallie, the last thing in the world we want is for somebody to make the decision to get the shot and then not be able to, right? I mean, usually we think that most of the battle is convincing somebody that that, that the vaccine is good for them. This shouldn't come as a surprise to any of us. This is actually what's happening now is really more typical of what a typical vaccine rollout would look like when it's not being funded and executed by the federal government. The issue here is, is a twofold, if you will. So... If you have private insurance, the ACA has basically stipulated that your insurance company needs to cover the shots. But there's all this little, you know, little um, the d devil in the details, if you will. What if you have a deductible that you need to meet or something like that? You can see how the insurance company might try to skirt it. But I think the bigger issue here is that this really just has to do with their coding systems. Their coding systems have to be updated. It doesn't happen overnight to be able to recognize these new codes so that they can actually accept a charge and that you can get reimbursed for it. If you've got, if it's Medicare, Medicaid, or the Bridge Access Program, or the COVID, COVID vaccine program for children, you should be able to do this a little bit more seamlessly. But with private insurance, there's a couple of little like hurdles along the way that are really more bureaucratic and regulatory than anything else. What's the um, sort of forecast here then, Dr. Natalie, based on your professional expertise here? In two weeks, do you think these issues go away, get resolved? I think they do. You know, I can tell you, yes, it was really easy for, for me to just order it through my electronic medical record and the patients would just go to straight to the vaccine center at NYU and get their COVID shots. It's not like that now. I'm sending everyone, keep trying your pharmacy. You get the flu and the COVID shot at the same time. Um, persistence will definitely uh, win out here.
Dr. Natalie Azar, thank you very much. You Lots more to get to here on the show, including why Ohio seems to be having so many more missing children in similar states, and where officials say the problem is particularly bad. This new reporting just into us in just a second. Plus, the top Russian commander that Ukraine said it killed, allegedly seen alive. The new video Russia's putting out today in the five things. Some alarming new numbers out today about the number of missing children in and around Cleveland with 45 kids apparently reported missing in just the last month. The numbers get even bigger when you look at the state as a whole. Last year, 1,600 missing kids reported there. Now, that's more than some states with similar populations like Pennsylvania, Illinois, Georgia, North Carolina. In some instances, it's almost double. I want to bring in Shaquille Brewster to break this down for us. Help us understand what's happening uh, and what the response has been. Why are we hearing so much about this today? Hi there, Hallie. Look, yes, the numbers are certainly alarming. And I actually spoke to the president of a group that provides support for families of missing kids in the Cleveland area. And when I asked him what the main issues are and what's leading to this, he said that there's not one thing you can point to. So he said there are contributing factors, things like the start of the school year, things like uh, the weather being better and now making a turn. Uh, one thing that you also heard earlier in the summer from the police chief, the Cleveland police chief, is that, yes, he acknowledged there's a surge, there's an uptick in these reports of missing children. He says that uh, he saw a surge this summer of about 20 percent, but the vast majority of these children are being recovered, and it's in large part thanks to what you're seeing from the public. I want you to listen to a little bit more of my conversation with the head of that uh, support group, Hallie. We don't want to send out some scathing alarm that there's like a serial abductor out there or things our kids are just vanishing off the streets. You know, it's safe to say that the, the vast majorities are in fact runaways. But that's still a concern because these children are young uh, and, you know, they think that they know everything, but they don't. So, yes, he is saying this is, you know, this is serious, but don't uh, start panicking about this. And also he acknowledges that it's because of people talking about this, because of those bulletins, because of programs like the ones he runs and the website like you have in uh, the state of Ohio, where the attorney general lists everyone who's missing. That has helped connect those missing kids uh, back with their families, Hallie. What else do we know about who these kids are and any hope around finding them where they might be? Yeah, when you go through that attorney general's website, and even in my conversation uh, with the chief there, he said that uh, most of these kids are between the ages of 13 and 17, that they have access to transportation, that they usually have cell phones and are communicating with people. He mentioned one story where uh, a kid was actually hiding in the house of another kid, uh, and the parent either didn't know or started lying about it to protect that kid. So there's a lot of different factors here. Listen to a little bit more of the conversation I had with uh, that president of the organization. Organization. We want to point out to the public that, you know, we want to use them as an asset to help us, but the number a little bit higher than normal, yes, but, you know, there's also logical uh, reason for that as well with some of the runaways, uh, but we also have to look at there are some uh, facilities for juveniles where the staff is not able to detain them if they want to leave. So the majority are runaways. One point to underscore here, Hallie, is yes, you may think, oh, they're running away. They should be OK. They'll be fine. But he's saying the danger there is that that is the population. Those are the type of kids that people who do want to cause harm to children look out for, those who are running away from their parents. So even those who are leaving intentionally, there is a lot of risk there. And that's why you're hearing uh, people say this is something you should focus on, even if it's not a full-blown crisis in the greater Cleveland area, Hallie. Shaq Brewster, we're grateful to you for shining a spotlight on this. Thank you. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, Ukraine says it is clarifying, quote unquote, what's going on with that top Russian commander. Remember, Ukraine says it killed him in a missile attack, but the Russian defense ministry is putting out this video today that appears to show him at a meeting. NBC News has not verified when or where it was filmed. Number two, J.P. Morgan says it'll pay the Virgin Islands $75 million to settle claims it enabled Jeffrey Epstein's sex trafficking. That's the U.S. Virgin Islands. Most of the money is going to go to local charities and victim assistance programs. The bank also says it got to a confidential agreement with the former executive who managed the Epstein account. Lawyers for the former exec did not immediately respond to our request for comment, but he has previously called the accusations baseless. 
Number three, lawyers for former President Trump want a judge to reject prosecutors' requests for a gag order in that 2020 election interference case. The special counsel's order, remember we talked about it earlier this month when it happened. They filed this. They basically said, we don't want Donald Trump to talk about stuff related to the case, witnesses, et cetera, saying that he had said inflammatory things. Mr. Trump's attorneys say it's part of an effort, in their view, to try to silence his political speech. Number four, the doping hearing for top Russian figure skater Camila Valieva is beginning today in Switzerland. Remember her? She helped Russia win the team figure skating gold during the last Olympics. The U.S. came in second, but then she tested positive for a banned heart medication. She says it was accidental contamination from tablets her grandfather took. Depending on what happens here, it's possible that the U.S. could end up with the gold medal from that Olympics. We'll see. Number five, imagine what the world's going to look like in 250 million years. Wrap your brains around that. Well, <laughs> some new research tries to, suggesting that all the continents will come back together to form a supercontinent. Maybe kind of like this. This is some of the imagery that scientists were sharing. They think it could be so crazily hot and dry. And they say mammals that live on land could go extinct. So, bit of a bit of a piece of news there for you. Let's talk about what's happening out west, because two Las Vegas teenagers are being arraigned today and officially charged with murder for allegedly killing a cyclist after driving their car into him on purpose. Police say the two suspects recorded themselves laughing in the car as they approached this victim. Listen. <laughs> Moments later, the car heads toward retired police officer Andy Probst on his bike. We are obviously stopping in there, stopping the video there. Uh, but the car then hits him from behind. The teens allegedly keep driving, leaving him lying in the street. Dana Griffin is joining us now. And Dana, uh, the, the teens are accused of three, I believe, three hit and run incidents that same morning with cars that they stole. What else do we know today about what they're accused of doing and any other news from that appearance? Hey, Hallie. Yeah, investigators say that this was a part of that this was part of a crime spree that happened earlier that day. Four cars stolen, three people hit, including a driver and a 72-year-old cyclist that was hit from behind but survived. Investigators say that this is such a heinous thing, and it was that video that led to these murder charges once that video came to light several days after this happened. So the two suspects here have both had their initial appearances. Uh, it is expected that these cases will be tried together, uh, but that's something that they are still working out through the legal system. Them. The motive behind this is really unclear, uh, but the victim's daughter actually spoke after these arrests, and she said that she believes that this was not because of her dad's race or because of his profession, but it was just a really heartbreaking, dumb crime that these kids committed, allegedly. And she said that she kind of blames social media, because a lot of mm. things that are trending forces these young teens to want to record it and show their friends. And so that's another part of this. And it's obviously going to be a part of the investigation. That video, that heinous video, uh, will be a major part of this investigation, Hallie. The t uh, both of these two are being charged as adults, right, but they can't face the death penalty. Mm -hmm. What are the consequences here if, in fact, they end up convicted? So the interesting about Nevada state law is if you are uh, charged with murder, your, your case is already automatically sent to a to the adult system. However, the teens cannot face the death penalty if they are convicted in adult court of murder committed before they were 18. And according to the 18-year-old's public defender, he was 17 at the time. He recently turned 18. So the max they could receive is 20 years to life in prison. Hallie. Dana Griffin, thank you very much for that reporting. Appreciate it. We are just learning in the last hour or so that Target is shutting down nine of its stores in some big cities. Why? Uh, not necessarily because of the economy, but they say because of crime and theft problems. That comes at the same time that this big chain, CVS, says it's going to shut down hundreds of its stores by the end of next year. I want to bring in CNBC's Ron Insana, who is joining us now. Let's take this in a couple of buckets here, Ron. Let's start with Target and this news um, from that company, because they are specifically citing what they say is safety issues, right? Um, they want to, they say, be part of the, these communities, but they're concerned about what they see as organized retail crime becoming such an issue in these nine locations. 
Yeah, and, and Helly, we've seen this in, in a number of cities around the country, smash and grabs and organized crime against retailers, which has cost billions upon billions of dollars over the last couple of years. It's a relatively new phenomenon, I might add, that, um, you know, in one instance in the city of Los Angeles, in a strip mall, there was something like $300,000 worth of goods stolen um, just from a smash and grab. So this has been going on in kind of at-risk cities around the country. And so, yeah, Target, which is, you know, subject to, to economic swings, is really focused more on, on the at-risk risk stores, uh, whereas CVS has other issues with which to contend. Well, but do, well, when you talk about Target, right, citing the issue yeah. of theft, et cetera, we've seen other chains do that, other companies. I'm thinking of Walgreens, for example. But didn't the yeah. Walgreens uh, leader come out sort of after the fact and say, well, we may have overstated, in fact, the impact of that on our stores? In other words, how do we know what, what really is the case for some of these chains? Yeah, I mean, I think in specific instances, obviously, there have been elements of, of organized retail crime that have affected, you know, pockets of, of, of uh, regions around the country. Uh, in the broader sense, though, when you look at a CVS or you look at some of these, you know, kind of mainline retailers, they're also looking at the fact that their online presence continues to grow while their uh, bricks and mortar presence continues to shrink. And so rather strategically, in the case of CVS, they begin reduce, they started reducing the number of stores mm -hmm. last year by 200, and they're going to do 300 a year for the next two years, in part because online is growing and they're converting some of their stores more to uh, places where you might go get vaccines or you might go get a checkup, a very brief checkup, yeah. uh, and become yeah. more of a, a healthcare operation than a pharmacy. So to be clear, the CVS closures, and again, we showed those numbers a moment ago, 900 yeah. stores, which is like 10% of all the CVSs in right. this country, more to do with shift in consumer habits, shift in our habits as customers, and not so much on the crime issue. Fair? Fair, fair enough. Yeah, with CVS, absolutely. Okay. I mean, they did mention crime, but the, it, more, more or less, this has to do with the shift to online uh, where a lot of their services or a lot of their products can be purchased online and you can either curbside pickup or you can have them delivered to your house. And so right. it reduces the need to run that kind of overhead in a bricks and mortar operation. Ron and Sana, thank you very much. NBC News Thanks, covers Sana. hundreds of stories every day. And because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our bureau teams have done it for you. This is what they tell us is going down in their regions in a segment we call The Local. Out of our Southeast Bureau, officials in Florida say a man's recovering after being attacked by a rabid otter. This is somebody who was apparently feeding ducks in a pond when this otter bit him. Apparently it was an attack that lasted for several minutes. Then the otter goes after a dog. A neighbor ended up trapping the otter. They called animal control. Officials say, hey, people should avoid contact with wildlife right now in that region. Out of our Midwest Bureau, a woman in Missouri says she's trying to prove that she's not dead. She says she can't go to college or buy a house because there is this perception that she, in fact, passed away years ago. Our affiliate in St. Louis found the government wrongly labels thousands of living Americans dead every year, usually because of a mistake. And out of our Northeast Bureau, a pair of front row balcony tickets to Ford, Ford's Theater just sold at an auction in Boston for $260,000. And if you... I, you probably can guess where the story is going. If you're thinking, how come somebody would spend so much money on those tickets? They are tickets for the night that President Abraham Lincoln was assassinated in the presidential box way back in 1865. Look at them. They still have the this night only stamp, the handwritten seat, the section numbers, etc. Piece of history there. Coming up, Armenia's warning of ethnic cleansing with tens of thousands of people rushing to its border. The latest on what is a growing humanitarian crisis. Next. Nearly 70 people have been killed and hundreds more have terrible injuries from burns in Azerbaijan after a huge explosion at a crowded gas station last night. Look at this smoke and flames at the scene there. You had Russian peacekeepers evacuating some of the people who were hurt to nearby hospitals via these helicopters here. The victims, mostly ethnic Armenian refugees who are leaving their homes in this hotly contested region just days after the Azerbaijan government took total control of the territory in this very fast military campaign. This is the latest development in a conflict that's been happening for decades, colored by allegations now of ethnic cleansing. Just listen to how Armenia's prime minister describes it. The ethnic cleansing of Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh is uh, underway, so that's happening just now, and that is a very unfortunate fact. So far, more than 28,000 refugees have crossed over the border. That's more than a fifth of all the ethnic Armenians who are living in the region. And resources there? 
Well, they're not easy to come by. That's because there's been a military blockade for about 10 months. And because of that, look at this. Look at these satellite pictures. This is the mountainous route to the border. It's an unbelievable traffic jam. I want to bring in NBC's Matt Bradley, who is covering this one for us here. It is a growing refugee crisis, a humanitarian crisis. Talk us through what we know, Matt. Yeah, I mean, it's a growing refugee crisis and one that might end soon. As you mentioned, it looks as though there aren't going to be that many refugees who are going to be able to cross the border because they've already done so. And these are ethnic Armenians, as you mentioned, inside this enclave of Nagorno-Karabakh that's not far from Armenia proper. And that's why so many people have just been picking up sticks, leaving Nagorno-Karabakh, which the Armenians call Artsakh, and are moving now to Armenia, where they're going to be facing lots of additional difficulties, as any refugee does. Many of them have family and friends in Armenia proper, but for the rest, they're going to be needing government housing, they're going to be needing food, medical attention, because as you mentioned, a lot of these people have already endured a 10-month blockade at the hands of the Azerbaijanis, and in addition to that, round after round of heavy fighting, shelling, fighting in the streets, of Nagorno-Karabakh, and this has left, as you've seen, with a lot of these people who are crossing the border, a lot of them are starved, they're skinny, yeah. they're wounded, showing visible wounds on their bodies, and they're desperate. They've endured so much leading up till now, and, you know, the sadness here for these people, Hallie, it's not just that they've lost their homes, it's also that they've lost their homeland. This is a three-decade-long conflict and one that has defined the lives of so many of the people who are now leaving Nagorno-Karabakh, and effectively... Politically, this is now over. We don't see many of these intractable ethnic conflicts coming to an end mm. so abruptly after lasting for so many decades, but this is what we're seeing right now. It's nothing less than the end of one of the defining conflicts of the post-Soviet Union states of the past several years. Hallie? Where is the U.S. in all this, Matt? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. In the U.S., we have Samantha Powers, who's the head of the USAID. She was there just today in Armenia pledging more money, um, about coming up to about $12 million, which isn't all that much, but we're not talking about a particularly large population of people. But the U.S. has been standing on the sidelines trying to determine, you know, basically how to weigh in. This isn't an easy conflict for anyone to weigh in, and that's probably one of the reasons why so many Americans have not heard about this at all. You know, when you speak to Americans, they've never heard mm -hmm. of Nagorno-Karabakh, and it's one of the things that's so outrageous for the people uh, in this part of the world that they feel as though they're facing something like genocide or ethnic cleansing, and nobody in the West seems to be talking about it, not nearly to the extent that they're talking about other conflicts. So the U.S. is basically in this situation where they're trying to decide what to do. The Azerbaijanis have guaranteed that any of the Armenians who are left remaining in that ethnic enclave, they will simply be absorbed as minority populations within the greater Azerbaijani population, which does guarantee them certain rights, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're safe. Uh, and a lot of Armenians, after, again, 10 months of this blockade and three decades of intractable fighting, they're not going to believe any guarantees from the Azerbaijanis. So the U.S. right now, they're trying to decide what to do. Hallie. Matt Bradley, uh, an important story, critical, of course, to that region. Thank you very much for shining some light on it. Still to come, seven people will be on tomorrow's Republican presidential debate stage, set to be at least. Why it might be hard for some folks to tune in and the controversy around one of the places where you'll see it next. In just about 24 hours from now, we will see some, but not all, of those Republican primary presidential candidates hit the stage for their second debate. Former President Donald Trump, he's not going to be there, right? We saw that the first time. That's the expectation for tomorrow night, even though he's really ahead in the polls, as you see here. But there again, you'll have Florida Governor Ron DeSantis in that center spot as the next sort of next contender there, kind of a front runner for the night, at least, on that stage. And a memo from his campaign has given us some insight about his plan of attack, set to criticize the former president on one hand, saying that he continues to replicate Joe Biden's quote-unquote campaign from the basement strategy, but saying on the other hand, while other candidates may take this opportunity to distract or level false attacks, DeSantis stays laser-focused on the mission at hand. If you want to watch, if you want to see how that all plays out, and if you've cut the cord, right, you're going to have to stream it on Rumble, like for the first debate, a platform that's been criticized for promoting far-right extremism. 
bigotry, election disinformation, and conspiracy theories. I want to bring in Brandy Zadrozny for more on this. And Brandy, there's this investigation last year by a firm that monitors misinformation online, finding nearly half the videos on Rumble that came up when you looked for anything related to the last election came from sources that weren't trustworthy. Walk us through Rumble and the kind of um, the, the, the way that it's been under the microscope and in some ways under fire here. Yeah, Rumble is a video sharing platform. It's a lot like YouTube. It was started in 2013 by a Canadian entrepreneur, uh, Chris Pavlovsky. So it was really just a regular um, YouTube clone. You know, it had pictures of dogs and videos of cats and babies, and that's kind of where it was. But something happened in 2020 because Rumble wasn't doing so well. And so in 2020, when we were facing, you know, rampant misinformation about COVID and the election, and YouTube was saying, get off our platform with that and was instituting some um, um, content moderation, Rumble came in and put out a welcome sign and said, please, everybody that was just kicked off those platforms, please come here. And you can really see it in this sweeping sort of about page that Rumble has, where they say, you know, basically, we will not censor you. This is where free speech lives. They say that... Um, they, they're immune to cancel culture. And that stance has really attracted the far right creators and conspiracy theorists to the platform. And when you talk about the user base of the platform, it's something like, as far as we know from the latest figures, 44 million. A lot of people, right? You talk about YouTube, though, billions of users, right? I mean, it's apples and oranges here. How much could a moment like this, right, streaming a moment like the Republican presidential debate, move the needle for Rumble? Yeah, it is really important to say, I'm so glad you did, that it really is a niche niche platform. This is a small amount of people, right? However, um, you know, if you even look at their filings, they're now a publicly traded company as of last year. If you look at their quarterly findings, they are filings, they're actually bleeding monthly active users. So they're about half of what they were this time last year. So they need more than extremists to watch their programming. They need a mainstream audience and aligning themselves with the GOP might do this. Now, an interesting question too is not does Rumble need the GOP, but does the GOP need Rumble? Right. And mm -hmm. what I think is interesting here is that it's not just a platform. Rumble's actually soliciting donations for the RNC. And they say on their live stream that they'll put your name on a ticker across the bottom of it. So that um, that says something to me. That's sort of important. Not that it's just some random platform, but that they are partners. And, you know, for their part, at least, the RNC gave a statement to the AP um, and they said specifically went to distance themselves. And they said hate, bigotry and violence is unfortunately prevalent on every Every social media platform and the RNC condemns it entirely, but the RNC does not manage content or pages outside of our own. So that's the RNC. What about Rumble? How have they responded to the criticism about the misinformation and extremism on its platform? For its part, Rumble has said, we have done our part. We take away unlawful content. We take away explicit racism. Um, but, you know, you only have to go on the front page of Rumble to see how welcome misinformation and um, vitriol really is on the platform. Brandy Zudrosny, thank you very much. Be sure to join us for special coverage of that Republican primary debate tomorrow night, 11 o'clock Eastern, hosted by my friend and colleague Kristen Welker. I will see you there. We'll be up watching it. We'll be talking about it afterwards. I'll see you then. I'll also see you a little bit later on this network because that's a wrap for this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. We are coming on the air tonight with something we haven't seen before. A sitting president joining the picket line at a critical moment for the labor movement in this country. Coming up, where things stand with those auto workers, even as another union is set to strike with thousands more jobs at stake. We're also just learning tonight a New York judge has ruled that former President Trump committed fraud and lied about his net worth for years. What happens now with his civil trial set to start next week? Then, a drip, drip, drip turning to a deluge of pressure for an indicted senator to step down. We'll take you live to the Capitol with Bob Menendez back to work today and telling our team he's innocent. Plus, a manhunt tonight for the suspect in the death of a young tech executive in Baltimore whose accomplishments landed her on the 30 under 30 list for Forbes. What we are finding out from police just as we're coming on the air. And the president's dog apparently biting somebody else. What we know about what happened and how the White House is responding to it coming up in just a bit. Hey there, I'm Hallie. And tonight the spotlight is on not one, not two, but four big unions across different industries to see what's going to happen next in a key mo moment, not just for the labor movement, 
but for our whole economy. And President Biden, he is getting personally involved. Look at this. He is making history by becoming the first sitting president to join the picket lines. There he is in Michigan. It's a big show of support for this auto workers union, and it's a potentially controversial one. Watch. The UAW, you saved the automobile industry back in 2008 and before. Made a lot of sacrifices, gave up a lot, and the companies were in trouble. But now they're doing incredibly well. And guess what? You should be doing incredibly well, too. Stick with it, because you deserve the significant raise. You deserve a significant raise, he says. You've got this labor fight overlaid on the political fight ahead in 2024, because 24 hours now, it's going to be the former president's turn to make an appearance in Michigan. You've got Donald Trump set to make a speech of his own there. So the auto worker strike stretches on as one in Hollywood gets even bigger, with the Actors Guild voting almost unanimously to add video game actors to the mix. Still TBD if and when we'll see them join the picket lines. That says the writers look ready to get back to work, ending its five-month strike with a vote maybe tonight. Still on the horizon, yet another industry potentially voting to greenlight a strike of its own. Maybe also tonight, we're talking about the powerful culinary and bartenders union in Las Vegas. Now, if they end up walking off the job, it could totally flip the hospitality industry on the Vegas Strip upside down. David Noriega is covering that piece of it and all things West Coast out in L.A. But I want to start with Maggie Vespa, who's live for us in the Midwest in Michigan with the latest. I mean, we see them behind you, Maggie, right? I mean, these workers are continuing to do what they've been yep. doing for the last couple of weeks, and that is get on the picket line. Joined today by President Biden, who is walking the line, if you will, in more ways than one. Talk us through it. Yeah, Hallie, exactly. By the way, you can hear them chanting, no pay, no parts. This is one of the parts distribution facilities owned by Chrysler owner Stellantis uh, here in the Detroit area that was closed down on Friday. One of those 38 new facilities and part of the expansion. And yeah, you know, we talked about this moment in the last hour, but I think that point that President Biden made um, answering a reporter's question really kind of speaks to how delicately he is walking the political line while getting on the picket line. He was asked if he endorses one specific demand from the UAW and that is that demand for a 40 percent raise and the president answering that question he said yes i think they should be able to bargain for that bargaining for that being key verbiage that he used in that moment and the reason that's kind of so complicated it's sort of an issue that is a backdrop here for so many when it comes to the president's visit, and that is electric vehicles. The companies have said the Biden administration's mandate for the industry to shift to electric has left the big three, the companies say, unable to afford the union's demands, including that 40 percent pay raise. So you've got him kind of walking that line there, supporting the union, but not all out endorsing that demand. That being said, people here are elated to have a sitting president joining them on the lines period. Here's some of what we heard today. He said he'd walk the picket line and he is. We've had other presidents in the past say if they're going on strike, they're going to put their tennis shoes on and walk the line with us. And they didn't. He definitely is doing his walking the walk and talking the talk. And we should know people here are also incredibly aware that, yes, former President Trump, now kind of round two in this in this series of presidential visits, now set to uh, arrive here tomorrow night. People have differing feelings on both of these visits. But again, the sort of consensus that we're hearing more broadly is any attention is good attention. Any pressure is good pressure. People here just want to deal. And they think this added spotlight might possibly be able to help, Hallie. So where do negotiations stand? When is going to be the next key moment here for both of these sides, the auto workers union and then these two of the big three car companies to sit down at the table and try to hash something out? Sure. Well, talks are ongoing as we speak. All three companies have said that. The union has said that. And the union is really clear that they say Ford, uh, Ford has basically made more progress as far right. as meeting their demands than Stellantis and GM have. And that hasn't changed in the last couple of days since we sort of got that last update. So, again, right now, and you can see some of the key demands there, there's that uh, pay increase, 46 percent over 40 years, a 32-hour work week, things like that. Uh, and, again, the union saying Ford has come to the table on a number of their demands, but they still have a long way to go. Ford acknowledging that as well. GM and Stellantis, they say, basically have longer to go in their contract talks. So, honestly, not really any foreseeable light at the end of the time. But again, we should just note time and time again that these talks are continuing and all three of the big three say they intend to continue them in good faith, Hallie.
Maggie Vespa, live for us there in Michigan. Maggie, thanks for following every beat of it. Appreciate it. I want to bring in David Noriega in Los Angeles, who is covering every beat of a couple of other strikes. Three of them, really, right? One that looks to be potentially ending as soon as tonight, one that could begin as soon as tonight, and one that is continuing to stretch on. That third one, of course, the actor's strike. It looks like video game actors are going to be joining in on that. Explain, um, explain the domino impact of that, right, David? Yeah, so actors have voted overwhelmingly, as you said, to authorize a strike against 10 of the biggest video game companies. That pertains to a, a labor contract for the sorts of acting that goes into video games, so things like motion capture and voice acting. That doesn't mean a strike is going to happen. It just means that SAG, the union, is authorized to call a strike if it comes to that in the negotiations. That would be in addition to the ongoing strike that actors have been on since July against the studios um, and streamers. That's for sort of conventional action for acting for movies and TV shows. Whether the video game component uh, becomes a part of this is yet to be seen. But what's happening with the TV, um, the, the, the movie studios and the streamers is that there's high hopes right now in Hollywood. The expectation is that because the studios were willing to come to the table and reach an agreement with the writers, they will be willing to do so with the actors as well. And the, the general hope is that they'll be willing to do so in pretty short order. Hallie? So copy on that piece of it. Talk through what's happening in Las Vegas here, um, because, you know, it, it is not often, I think, that we as news organizations are talking about not one, not two, not three, but multiple strikes all in sort of this, this very condensed time period. There is an economic impact here, and that's especially true in Vegas if this powerful culinary union does decide to go on strike. When will we know more about that and what could the impact be? So the culinary workers are voting to authorize a strike tonight. So we should know by the end of tonight whether that's going to happen. Do we think if that they will? does happen, I think the expectation is that they are likely to. But again, we're not going to know until the votes are in at the end of the night. As you've said, if they do, that would be that would be huge. That union hasn't gone on strike in more than three decades. It would affect, uh, like all of these strikes, it would have knock-on effects on multiple parts of the of, of the economy, the local economy in Vegas, and obviously, given how much Vegas depends on tourism, the national economy, right? And that's what we've seen here in LA, right? With these with these entertainment industry strikes, uh, when the writers go out on strike and then the actors go out on strike, it doesn't just affect them; it affects crews, it affects you know below the line crew workers, it affects everyone from dry cleaners and caterers who work on TV and movie productions, these strikes have major reverberations across the industry. That's what we've seen in LA. And whether or not these unions uh, are, are, are able to wrap up these strikes quickly is something that millions of people are looking at, not just the workers involved. Hallie? David Noriega, live for us in Los Angeles, our newest NBC News correspondent. Good to have you, David. Thanks. We've got some breaking news coming into us just since we've been on the air here. A New York judge now ruling that former President Donald Trump committed fraud and lied about his net worth for years. This is according to some court documents just into us, with the judge saying Mr. Trump lied to banks, to insurers, and exaggerated his net worth to the tune of, like, billions of dollars. This is ahead of a civil trial that's set to start Monday as... The former president's attorneys, spokespeople, are pushing back, saying, in part, it's important to remember that the Trump Organization is an American success story and the fact that a judge without trial would say there's no question of fact and issue a decision like this in summary judgment is concerning. They plan to appeal. I want to bring in Danny Savalos, who's live for us now. So, Danny, help us explain this, right? A judge is saying that um, the former president lied and inflated his net worth even before this civil trial begins. How does that happen? It has to do with what's called summary judgment. Once discovery is over and prior to trial, the parties either side can file motions for summary judgment. And that's exactly what happened here. The defense uh, moved for summary judgment. That was summarily denied. In other words, the Trump team tried to get the case thrown out. The, uh, the Office of the Attorney General moved for summary judgment, and it was partially granted, but partially not. And when that happens, the remainder of the case, the part for which summary judgment was not granted, moves on to trial. Summary judgment is basically saying to the judge, hey, judge, discovery is over. Uh, we can win this case just on the discovery. The defense can't even make out an issue of fact for trial. There's nothing for the jury to even decide because it's undisputed, these facts. And on these undisputed facts, you can decide the issues of law. And that's exactly what Judge Ngoron did. Uh, he decided one of the counts, and that's one where he had to conclude that there was fraud. That's why it was reported that he did 
deem that the Trump defense uh, committed fraud or the Trump uh, parties committed fraud. Uh, but the remainder of the counts, uh, he denied summary judgment. It doesn't mean that either party loses. It just means the case moves on to trial. Uh, are you surprised to hear in just the last couple of minutes that the Trump team says they do plan to appeal? Or is that something that you might expect in a situation like this? Yes, I would expect it. However, this 35-page opinion excoriates the defense for raising issues, again, that were already supposedly decided on appeal to the appellate division, and in fact, considers that in the motion for sanctions. So this is something that the opinion uh, addresses, that the defense is raising and re-raising issues after they've already been decided by the Court of Appeals, excuse me, I should say the appellate court, the Court of Appeals in New York is the highest court, it's the state Supreme Court. But they will appeal, I'm sure, but they should be careful to try not to raise issues that have already been decided and uh, are no longer live. Danny Savalos, thank you very much for breaking that one down for us. We will see how things go. And this begins, of course, the civil trial on Monday. Appreciate it. In just the last couple of minutes back here in Washington, we are seeing newly indicted Senator Bob Menendez on Capitol Hill for the first time since federal prosecutors charged him in a bribery scandal. And he's in a bit of an exchange with our own Ryan Nobles, saying he is not guilty of the charges he faces. I want you to listen to this. Will you run for re-election, sir? As I said, I'm here to do the work of the people of New Jersey. Why won't you right. resign, sir, Senator Menendez? Because I'm innocent. What's wrong with you guys? We're that comes as we are seeing a deluge now of pressure from some of Menendez's Democratic colleagues in just the last 24 hours, with 17 more Democratic senators. So these are people in Bob Menendez's party, senators who serve with him, saying, yes, he should step down. These are them. Remember, when we were on the show last night, 24 hours ago, only two Democratic senators had called on him to resign. There is a shift that has happened in the last day, and it includes this man. The other senator from New Jersey, Cory Booker, he has represented that state alongside Menendez for the last decade. He is also calling on him to resign. There's also now some new support bubbling up in the Senate for Menendez to be primaried, meaning for another Democrat to go up against him come his next election. Senator John Fetterman, Democrat from Pennsylvania, asked about that, saying, hell yeah, Menendez essentially should be prim uh, primaried, adding, quote, I'm quoting here, the last time there was a guy in New Jersey with this much cash in his house was Tony Soprano. NBC's Sahil Kapoor is following this one for us. Of course, that from Fetterman, a reference to some of the cash that the feds say was stuffed into Menendez's clothing as part of this bribery scheme, they allege. Um, and what is interesting here in this exchange with Ryan Nobles in just the last couple of minutes, Menendez was actually asked twice. I can't tell who asked him. He was asked twice if he would run for re-election. Both times, he didn't answer yes or no. He simply said he's here to do the work for the people of New Jersey. It is, I, I wonder how you are reading that from Senator Menendez Mendez tonight, considering now you have at least one sitting member of Congress on the House side saying they do plan to primary Menendez. Yeah, that's right, Hallie. Menendez is certainly defiant, refusing uh, growing calls from his fellow Democratic senators to resign and says he is not going anywhere. He has not announced that he's actually running for re-election in 2024. And uh, one uh, little bit of news over the last few hours would complicate that effort because Gary Peters, the chairman of the Democratic Senatorial Campaign Committee, who's in charge of getting members elected and re-elected, has said uh, Menendez should resign. It's an indication that Menendez will not be able to count on the support of his party if he were to run for re-election. But what Menendez is doing is saying he's innocent, that the charges haven't been proven, that people shouldn't rush to conclusions. Democrats uh, agree that he, you know, is entitled to the presumption of innocence until proven guilty. They don't agree that he is entitled to remain a senator because they believe that that has a higher bar than perhaps not being a criminal uh, to have the trust of your constituents. That's where things stand right now with Menendez. And we'll see just how much these calls uh, continue to grow for him to resign. One person who has not made such a call is Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. I'll get to that in a second, but let me just go back to this moment, this exchange that he had with those reporters. I don't know if we can roll the video here. We don't need to play it, but like people, if, if you don't know, at the Capitol, there's places where you can have cameras and talk to members of Congress. There are places where you can't. With that elevator video with Ryan Nobles and the senator, along with some other members of the press corps, you know, Menendez is getting into an elevator. Like, he, he seemed, it's the first time he's taking questions since this scheme was unveiled. These allegations were unveiled by federal prosecutors. You see it here. And I'm struck by him saying, like, what's wrong with you guys? I'm not resigning because I'm innocent, he says. He seems a bit perturbed uh, to be facing some of these questions, but they are likely to dog him now for weeks, Sahil. 
Yeah, weeks, maybe months, for however long he remains in the Senate. This is not one of those things that simply goes away. In order to be an effective senator, Hallie, and I know you know this, but you need allies. You need people mm -hmm. to sponsor your bills. You need, you know, committee chairs to hold hearings. You need people to vote with you on the floor. And the reason senators, in, in some cases in the past, have, have been pushed out, even though there haven't been, you know, definitive charges proven against them uh, of criminality, is that they lose the trust of their fellow members. That's what happened with Al Frank several years ago in the in the peak of the, the Me Too movement, uh, he got pushed out even though he insisted that uh, he was not he was innocent of the things that he was being accused of or that they were overblown. He lost the trust of his members. He had to go. The question is, how long is Menendez going to stick around if he increasingly loses the trust of his uh, fellow senators? Hallie? Somebody else who will face questions, continued questions about this, is going to be Chuck Schumer, of course, the Senate Majority Leader Sahil. When do we expect to hear more from him on this? Well, we expect Chuck Schumer to do his weekly press conference tomorrow, which is always one day after the Senate uh, uh, gavels in. The Senate's about to hold its first vote today. Schumer did not address Menendez on the floor, but he also hasn't spoken to reporters. He'll certainly get asked about this tomorrow. So far, he has only said that Menendez will relinquish his chairmanship of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He has not said anything further about whether he should step down and uh, stop being a senator. Hallie. Sahel Kapoor, lots to follow there on the Hill. Thank you. Let's take you to Baltimore now, where police tonight say a warrant is out for the arrest of 32-year-old Jason Billings Lee, who they say is a suspect in the killing of a rising star in the tech industry. You can see Billings Lee here. Police say they think he's still in the Baltimore area, that he's armed and dangerous, and that people should stay away. Call police right away if you see him. Officials say 26-year-old Pava LaPere was found dead in her apartment Monday, shortly after she was reported missing. She was the CEO of a company called Ecomap Technologies. She was on Forbes' 30 under 30 list this past year, earning a spot for the positive social impact her company has. NBC's Emily Aketa is following this for us. We've just gotten that update from police in the last hour. Emily, what else are we learning? Hey there, Hallie. Really some strong words from Baltimore police within the last hour or so, emphasizing the urgency in this manhunt for 32-year-old Jason Billingsley, who was wanted, as you mentioned, for first-degree murder. And really in a chilling statement, police pointed out, they said this is a man who is willing to kill, hurt people, rape people. And that is why they are underscoring the importance that people in the Baltimore area, they do believe Billingsley is still in the Baltimore area, but residents in the area exercise caution as this manhunt plays out involving law enforcement at all levels. For background, Bill Billingsley was previously arrested and convicted uh, a number of years ago on a variety of charges, including sex offense, second degree assault charges and robbery, all of those leading to convictions. Now he's wanted for first degree murder a year later since he's been released on parole for killing 26-year-old Pava LaPere. She was found yesterday morning in an apartment. She works, um, she works in the same building where she lives after she was reported missing and police found her with blunt force trauma. They do not think, and this is one of the things leading to the urgency and the danger in this situation, they do not think that LaPere knew her killer. So what do we know about LaPere? Well, she's a tech giant, as you mentioned, at just the age of 26 years old. She founded Ecomap Technologies while she was studying at Johns Hopkins University. That's a company that has raised nearly $8 million since its founding. The company speaking out in a statement today saying, quote, with profound sadness and shock, Ecomap announces the tragic and untimely passing of our beloved founder and CEO, Pava LaPere. The circumstances surrounding Pava's death are deeply distressing. She was not only the visionary force behind Ecomap, but was also a deeply compassionate and dedicated leader. At that news conference we heard in the last uh, hour or so, the Baltimore mayor revealed, you know, he is, this is someone that he got to know within the Baltimore tech community in the last couple of years. Take a listen here. Pava was a very young, talented, devoted Baltimorean, uh, someone that I had the opportunity to get to know over the past few years who would help anybody that she would see. And to have uh, that life cut short is something that should sit deep in the stomachs of all Baltimoreans tonight. Baltimore police, state police, the U.S. Marshals, all contributing to this sweeping manhunt this evening. They are uh, emphasizing their confidence in finding this individual who they say should be considered armed and dangerous, Hallie. Emily Aketa, thank you very much for bringing us the latest on this story.
Tonight, a huge lawsuit against Amazon could end up changing the way you use some of its services like Prime and other ways you shop. That's because U.S. regulators say Amazon's a monopoly. They're accusing Amazon of making the shopping experience worse for people and stopping competitors from making prices cheaper. Now, of course, Amazon is pushing back on this. It's not the first time they face these kind of allegations, but this time they're going up against the federal government and the muscle that that comes with. Here's Jake Ward. Tonight, the Federal Trade Commission calling Amazon a monopoly that blocks out competitors and prevents them from lowering prices, costing you money. According to an antitrust lawsuit filed by the FTC in 17 other states, Amazon, quote, violates the law not just because it's big, but because it prevents current competitors from growing and new competitors from emerging. Amazon firing back, saying in a statement that the FTC has, quote, radically departed from its mission of protecting consumers and competition and that the result of the suit will lead to higher prices and that it looks forward to making that case in court. That means we could be moving towards another massive head-to-head -head legal battle as the Department of Justice is in the middle of another antitrust trial with Google. The latest coming out of that courtroom today, shedding light on the deals Google made with other tech giants, Samsung and Apple, helping it solidify its search dominance. Google says it competed for those deals. The bold lawsuits should come as no surprise to anybody listening to the rhetoric from the president, who's been pushing for antitrust and action. And prevent big online platforms from giving their own products an unfair advantage. In the last few years, U.S. regulators also suing Meta and Microsoft. It's a high watermark for antitrust action since the Department of Justice's historic monopoly settlement with Microsoft two decades ago. Microsoft was back in court today. The government then accusing Microsoft of preventing consumers from easily choosing competing software, like then-popular Netscape, eventually put out of business by Microsoft's Internet Explorer. Microsoft agreed to open up in the settlement, which many experts say helped lead to an era of greater competition. Newer products like Google Search, Amazon's early marketplace, and Facebook emerge. Ironically, the very companies the government is going after now. So how does today's suit impact you? The FTC alleges Amazon engages in anti-competitive conduct in multiple ways. By biasing its search results so Amazon products are seen over others that Amazon knows are of better quality, according to the FTC. By punishing sellers that offer discounts across the Internet, burying them so far down that they become effectively invisible. And by charging sellers costly fees. Amazon controls as much as 50% of the online retail market, according to a House Judiciary report from 2020. But the FTC's case could be an uphill climb. Those suits against Meta and Microsoft, a defeat and a dismissal. Something not lost on former FTC Commissioner Moselle Thompson. If you're not successful in prosecuting, it actually sends the opposite message. And so that's going to be a challenge because in this case, there are some positive features that Amazon provides to people, and I'm sure they're going to raise them, that positive benefits to consumers. Jake is joining us now. Um, listen, Jake, scope and scale of this, this is significant here. And what's so interesting is that Lena Khan, who's, of course, the head of the FTC, um, this has been a topic that she has been interested in for years, ever since she was a law student back at Yale. That's right. I mean, you're, Hallie, you are hitting it right on the head, right? Not only is antitrust the lifeblood of what made her famous, what really made her famous was a, a, a paper she wrote as a law student in Yale specifically about Amazon. She wrote at the time that our old standards of using just price and output to gauge harm to consumers was not adequate to the current tech landscape that we are in. And then she specifically analyzed Amazon and said that because this company is actually incentivized not to think as much about price as it does about growth, and that as it it has grown as a platform. Its various things have come together. Its lines of business have come together and created what she said could be conditions for real predatory pricing. This is truly like flowing right out of her brain and into possible real law. The question, of course, is whether this string of defeats that she has faced at the FTC over the last few months means she's facing an uphill battle here or whether she may actually be able to set down some landmark new law that could seek to regulate tech in a whole new way, Hallie. Jake Ward, fascinating stuff. Thank you so much. Uh, keep us posted on how this one development. To some other developing news tonight, with word this evening that President Biden's dog has bitten yet another person, with the Secret Service saying last night an officer came into contact with Commander, that's the pup, and was bitten. Remember, just a few months ago, the conservative group Judicial Watch released a report that says Commander has had 10 what they called biting incidents in more than a year. I want to bring in Kelly O'Donnell, who's live for us at the White House. And we're hearing from the White House on this tonight. Right, Kel? 
That's right, Hallie. The White House, through the First Lady's office, which tends to respond to any matters dealing with the family, and of course, Commander Biden is a member of the family. If you're a dog lover, you know that to be true. And what they're saying is they, they have acknowledged before that the White House environment can be stressful for a dog, and they are trying to do what they can to make it a safe environment for him, and they express their appreciation to the Secret Service for all they do to keep the family safe. Uh, what we have learned over time is that this two-year-old German Shepherd has had a number of encounters, uh, typically with uh, members of the Secret Service who are either officers or agents, and that these bites have at times required medical care. In this instance last night, uh, the woman officer was treated on campus here by the White House Medical Office. We don't know uh, anything more about that injury, uh, but it is certainly a concern when a dog is stressed in this kind of a situation, and it is also a workplace. And uh, this is one of the conflicts that they've come into is that there have been a number of these instances over the last couple of years. The prior family dog, Major Biden, also a German Shepherd, that's the president's favorite breed, uh, was uh, sent to live with family friends because of similar biting instances. And so this has been a recurring problem that the first family has tried to deal with. They say they've uh, brought about training and they've tried to have some designated areas where uh, Commander Biden can run and play uh, that everyone knows are sort of his space and his turf, encouraging members who work here of, of any of the different kind of departments uh, to give him some room. But clearly, this is an ongoing problem and a risk for those who are around Commander Biden. Kelly O'Donnell live for us on the North Lawn. Kel, thank you. Coming up, prosecutors in Spain are rolling out some new charges against Shakira. What they say the superstar did for the second time. Plus, why one big bank in the UK says it'll start banning customers from certain transactions. We'll explain in just a sec. Some alarming new numbers out today on the number of missing children in and around Cleveland, with 45 kids reported missing in just the last month. The numbers get even bigger when you look at Ohio as a whole. 1,600 missing children reported in that state last year. That's more than states with similar populations, like Pennsylvania, you can see, Illinois, Georgia, North Carolina. In some cases, you can see there, like North Carolina, nearly double. I want to bring in Shaquille Brewster to break this down for us. So, Shaq, explain why we're finding out about this now and some of the, some of the, um, the impetus behind this. What's going on here? Yeah, Hallie, this is really a problem that you saw really continue to escalate since the start of the summer and now extending and making its way into the fall. I spoke to the head of Cleveland Missing. This is a group that helps uh, give support to families of missing kids in the Cleveland area. And he said that the cause of this is not one singular uh, thing. It's not that it's not like you can point to one issue and say that's the reason why you're seeing these numbers. He said part of it has to do with the warmer weather that we've been seeing. Part of it now has to do with the return to school. Uh, but he does emphasize that this is a serious issue. We heard from the police chief at the beginning of the summer that he was seeing about a 20 percent increase in the number of these kids who have been reported missing. Uh, I want you to listen to a little bit of what I heard from this uh, head of this uh, Cleveland Cares when he explained the type of people who are missing and why this is happening. We don't want to send out some scathing alarm that there's like a serial abductor out there or things our kids are just vanishing off the streets. You know, it's safe to say that the, the vast majorities are in fact runaways, but that's still a concern because these children are young uh, and, you know, they think that they know everything, but they don't. The Cleveland police chief uh, ended up saying over the course of the summer that the vast majority of these cases are closed, that these folks are found, these kids are found and reunited with their families. But of course, if there's any kid that's missing, that is a big concern. And the fact that that number is high is definitely a concern for many people in the greater Cleveland area, Hallie. Of course. I wonder what else we know about who these children are. I know that many of them, it seems, are older teens, right? 
Yeah, something that he said to me is that you're looking at people who are kids who are about 13 to 17 years old. You see some of their pictures on the screen right now. This is from the secretary, uh, uh, or excuse me, the Ohio Attorney General's website. But he says that these are kids with access to phones, usually access to some sort of transportation. You heard him mention before that uh, a lot of this is dealing with runaways, so people who are leaving intentionally. But listen to a little bit more about the type of uh, kid who uh, gets gets caught up in this and who uh, ends up on that missing list. We want to point out to the public that, you know, we want to use them as an asset to help us, but the number a little bit higher than normal, yes, but, you know, there's also logical uh, reason for that as well with some of the runaways. Uh, but we also have to look at, there are some uh, facilities for juveniles where the staff is not able to detain them if they want to leave. So a lot of factors involved here. The big thing that you hear from officials of all stripes is that uh, the help is that uh, it, it's about the public. You reunite these families uh, by seeing and looking at those missing kids posters and staying alert. And that helps solve this problem, Hallie. Shaq, thank you very much for, uh, for this reporting and for bringing some awareness to this. Let's get you over to the five things our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, Ukraine says it is clarifying What's happening with a top Russian commander? Remember, this is the guy Ukraine said they killed in a missile attack. But the Russian defense ministry is out with this video today that appears to show this commander at a meeting. NBC News has not verified when or where it was filmed. Number two, lawyers for a death row inmate in Alabama say he does not want to be what they call a test subject for a new execution method. We told you about how Alabama has restarted executions after pausing them for months. Now they're trying to become the first state to do nitrogen executions, meaning the inmate would breathe just nitrogen, depriving them of oxygen. Alabama is one of three states that have authorized this, but no state has actually performed it yet. Number three, Tampa police are investigating the death of former NFL player Mike Williams. They say he may have gotten unprescribed drugs while he was in the hospital after a construction site accident. Police say the investigation is looking into what they described as unprescribed narcotics by an outside party. Williams died two weeks ago at the age of 36. Number four, JP Morgan's Chase UK Digital Bank will ban customers from crypto transactions in just a few weeks. Why? Well, they say they've seen a rise in crypto scams targeting customers there, British customers. They want to try to keep people safe. This is after some other companies have done the same kind of thing. Number five, can you even wrap your brain around what the world's going to look like in 250 million years? Some researchers have, or at least they're trying to, and they say we're all going to be one big supercontinent that like all the continents will come back together, maybe kind of like this. You can see it in this, this image that scientists put out. They think it could be very hot, very dry, so hot and so dry that mammals will be extinct, mammals who live on land. So maybe good for the whales, maybe not so good for the humans. We'll see. 250 million years when we come back. Lots more to get to tonight in the show, including this new court appearance from two Las Vegas teens facing formal charges tonight for allegedly killing a bicyclist on purpose. What else we're learning about what they're being accused of? Plus, some big chains closing a bunch of stores across the country, but it's not because of sales necessarily. We'll explain. Two Las Vegas teenagers arraigned today, officially charged with murder for allegedly killing a cyclist after driving their car into him on purpose. Police say the two suspects recorded themselves laughing in the car as they're approaching this victim. <laughs> Moments later, you can see the car head toward retired police officer Andy Probst on his bike. We're stopping it there, of course, but the car hits him from behind. And these two people, 16 and 18, allegedly keep driving, leaving him lying in the street. Dana Griffin is joining us now. So these two suspects are accused of not just this, but multiple hit and runs in the same day with cars that they stole, right? What else are we learning from today's appearance? Yeah, Hallie, it's unclear of the motive at this point, but investigators say these intentional hit and runs started earlier in the day when these two teens allegedly stole four different cars and hit three 
different individuals, one guy who was driving in a sedan and another 72-year-old bicyclist who survived. Investigators arrested the first teen, 18-year-old Jesus Ayala, the alleged driver in this. They arrested him that day. It wasn't until days later when that video started circulating, and it was a school resource officer that brought the video to police to the attention of police because a student showed the school resource officer that video and that's what led to the second teen's arrest and these two murder charges among the other charges that we are seeing here. Uh, we heard from the victim's daughter who spoke after the arrest and said she does not believe that her father's race or his profession was the reason behind this and she's actually asked people to not use his death as a political tool to start other culture wars. Hallie? What about consequences here if these two people who by the way, are being charged as adults, but they can't face, face the death penalty. If they are convicted, what happens? Yeah, so according to Nevada state law, if you are charged with murder, you automatically go to the adult system, even if you are a minor. However, if the crime was committed before you were 18, in this case, this 18-year-old was actually 17 when the crime occurred. He recently turned 18. He and his co-defendant will likely only be eligible for 20 years to life in prison. Hallie? Dana Griffin, live for us with the latest there. Dana, thank you. We are just learning in the last hour or so that Target is closing nine of its stores in big cities across the country because of theft, problems with stuff getting stolen, problems with violence. We're talking New York, Seattle, San Francisco, Portland. Stores in those cities will close, again, not all of them, but nine of them, will close next month. Target says they can't keep operating safely because crime is threatening the security of staff and of customers. Now, crime is also a reason, but it seems to be a lesser one for CVS, which is shutting down a whole bunch of stores, 900 of them, by the end of next year. It's coming at a time when there's been a lot of attention on organized retail crime, cutting into stores' bottom lines, forcing some to close or even lock up. You've probably seen these things where you go and ask for someone to be lock up, stuff that gets stolen a lot. Ron and Sana is joining us now. So, Ron, talk us through the target piece of it here, because this is, you know, a fairly significant move by the company to shutter these nine stores for these reasons. And, and they are blaming it more on crime than almost anything else, uh, Haley. And, and, and the National Retail Federation says about $112 billion in losses in 2022 due to retail theft. And that's everything from shoplifting to more organized crime-style attacks on stores or malls where we've seen smash and grabs in places like Los Angeles and San Francisco that have mounted in some instances to hundreds of thousands of dollars. So in Target's case, they're suggesting that at least these store closures, so irrespective of what's happening with uh, them from an economic perspective, has more to do with, with crime than almost any other issue. The CVS piece of it um, yeah. is also interesting here. And when you look at the, the way that crime relates to the shuttering of stores, you look at something like Walgreens here, which closed some stores, but then the, uh, one of the Walgreens leaders, leaders came out and said, well, we may have like, overstated sort of what we yeah. thought was happening there. How should we be thinking about this? How are the companies thinking about this? Well, they're thinking on a variety of different levels. I mean, on the one hand, you have this issue, which, which, as I said, is, you know, costing $100-plus billion just last year. On the other hand, when you look at a CVS, which is effectively reorienting and restructuring its business due to the more rapid use of online purchases, whether it's deliveries of prescriptions, online prescription orders, deliveries, pickup at the store, curbside pickup, that type of thing, they're reorienting their business to reflect the changing dynamics of, of consumer behavior. And then they're also looking to convert some of the closed stores into health centers where you could get vaccinations or some type of health screening uh, that would uh, have less to do with crime and, and more to do with the way in which online retail is affecting bricks and mortar stores. And is that because you have more customers who are like ordering supplies they might yeah. pick up at the pharmacy online? Sure, absolutely, 100 percent. And, and, you know, you can do that curbside. Some prescriptions get delivered to your house in some instances. So, yeah, this is true across the retail landscape where we're seeing a lot of stores that have been big bricks and mortar operations put a lot more money into online and reduce their physical footprint across the country. Ron and Sana, our friend over there at CNBC. Ron, always good to see you. Thank you for that breakdown. Thanks, NBC News covers hundreds of international stories every day. And because it can be tough to read or watch or listen to them all, our teams around the world have done it for you. Here are some of what they're watching in a segment we call The Global. Out of the South China Sea, look at this. A diver from the Philippines taking out a floating barrier in this area that's contested. It's a prime fishing spot, like 120 miles off the coast of the Philippines. 
essentially China put down a barrier there last week. The Philippines says, well, hey, that violates international law and the country's own sovereignty. Out of Spain, prosecutors are charging Shakira with tax evasion for a second time. They say she didn't pay something like $7 million in taxes on the money she made in 2018. Shakira is already charged with tax evasion in a separate case about where she lived from 2012 to 2014. Her trial in that case is set to start in November. And in France, a very specific job fair, a job fair you might like to visit. It's for the Paris Olympics, which is coming up in less than a year. They're trying to help fill 16,000 openings at the Olympics. Stuff like catering, security, transportation, cleaning. If you want to weigh in, maybe that's your ticket, so to speak. Coming up, a lot more to get to here on the show, including thousands of ethnic Armenian refugees crossing the border with new allegations of ethnic cleansing. How the government there is responding next. Nearly 70 people have been killed and hundreds more have terrible injuries from burns in Azerbaijan after a huge explosion at a crowded gas station last night. Look at the smoke and flames at the scene there. You had Russian peacekeepers evacuating some of the people who were hurt to nearby hospitals via these helicopters here. The victims, mostly ethnic Armenian refugees who are leaving their homes in this hotly contested region just days after the Azerbaijan government took total control of the territory in this very fast military campaign. This is the latest development in a conflict that's been happening for decades, colored by allegations now of ethnic cleansing. Just listen to how Armenia's prime minister describes it. The ethnic cleansing of Armenians of Nagorno-Karabakh is uh, underway, so that's happening just now, and that is a very unfortunate fact. So far, more than 28,000 refugees have crossed over the border. That's more than a fifth of all the ethnic Armenians who are living in the region. And resources there? Well, they're not easy to come by. That's because there's been a military blockade for about 10 months and because of that, look at this. Look at these satellite pictures. This is the mountainous route to the border. It's an unbelievable traffic jam. I want to bring in NBC's Matt Bradley, who is covering this one for us here. It is a growing refugee crisis, a humanitarian crisis. Talk us through what we know, Matt. Yeah, I mean, it's a growing refugee crisis and one that might end soon. As you mentioned, it looks as though there aren't going to be that many refugees who are going to be able to cross the border because they've already done so. And these are ethnic Armenians, as you mentioned, inside this enclave of Nagorno-Karabakh that's not far from Armenia proper. And that's why so many people have just been picking up sticks, leaving Nagorno-Karabakh, which the Armenians call Artsakh and are moving now to Armenia, where they're going to be facing lots of additional difficulties, as any refugee does. Many of them have family and friends in Armenia proper, but for the rest, they're going to be needing government housing, they're going to be needing food, medical attention, because as you mentioned, a lot of these people have already endured a 10-month blockade at the hands of the Azerbaijanis, and in addition to that, round after round of heavy fighting, shelling, fighting in the streets, of Nagorno-Karabakh, and this is left, as you've seen, with a lot of these people who are crossing the border, a lot of them are starved, they're skinny, yeah. they're wounded, showing visible wounds on their bodies, and they're desperate. They've endured so much leading up till now, and you know, the sadness here for these people, Hallie, it's not just that they've lost their homes, it's also that they've lost their homeland. This is a three-decade-long conflict and one that has defined the lives of so many of the people who are now leaving Nagorno-Karabakh, and effectively, Politically, this is now over. We don't see many of these intractable ethnic conflicts coming to an end mm. so abruptly after lasting for so many decades, but this is what we're seeing right now. It's nothing less than the end of one of the defining conflicts of the post-Soviet Union states of the past several years. Hallie? Where is the U.S. in all this, Matt? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. In the U.S., we have Samantha Powers, who's the head of the USAID. She was there just today in Armenia pledging more money, um, about um, coming up about $12 million, which isn't all that much, but we're not talking about a particularly large population of people. But the U.S. has been standing on the sidelines trying to determine, you know, basically how to weigh in. This isn't an easy conflict for anyone to weigh in, and that's probably one of the reasons why so many Americans have not heard about this at all. You know, when you speak to Americans, They've never heard mm -hmm. of Nagorno-Karabakh, and it's one of the things that's so outrageous for the people uh, in this part of the world that they feel as though they're facing something like genocide or ethnic cleansing, and nobody in the West seems to be talking about it, not nearly to the extent 
that they're talking about other conflicts. So the U.S. is basically in this situation where they're trying to decide what to do. The Azerbaijanis have guaranteed that any of the Armenians who are left remaining in that ethnic enclave, they will simply be absorbed as minority populations within the greater Azerbaijani population, which does guarantee them certain rights, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're safe. Uh, and a lot of Armenians, after, again, 10 months of this blockade and three decades of intractable fighting, they're not going to believe any guarantees from the Azerbaijanis. So the U.S. right now, they're trying to decide what to do. Hallie. Matt Bradley, uh, an important story, critical, of course, to that region. Thank you very much for shining some light on it. Still to come, seven people will be on tomorrow's Republican presidential debate stage, set to be at least. Why it might be hard for some folks to tune in and the controversy around one of the places where you'll see it next. In just about 24 hours from now, we will see some, but not all, of those Republican primary presidential candidates hit the stage for their second debate. Former President Donald Trump, he's not going to be there, right? We saw that the first time. That's the expectation for tomorrow night, even though he's really ahead in the polls, as you see here. But there again, you'll have Florida Governor Ron DeSantis in that center spot as the next sort of next contender there, kind of a front runner for the night, at least, on that stage. And a memo from his campaign has given us some insight about his plan of attack, set to criticize the former president on one hand, saying that he continues to replicate Joe Biden's quote-unquote campaign from the basement strategy, but saying on the other hand, while well, other candidates may take this opportunity to distract or level false attacks, DeSantis stays laser-focused on the mission at hand. If you want to watch, if you want to see how that all plays out, and if you've cut the cord, right, you're going to have to stream it on Rumble, like for the first debate, a platform that's been criticized for promoting far-right extremism, bigotry, election disinformation, and conspiracy theories. I want to bring in Brandy Zadrozny for more on this. And Brandy, there's this investigation last year by a firm that monitors misinformation online, finding nearly half the videos on Rumble that came up when you looked for anything related to the last election came from sources that weren't trustworthy. Walk us through Rumble and the kind of, um, the, the, the way that it's been under the microscope and in some ways under fire here. Yeah, Rumble is a video sharing platform. It's a lot like YouTube. It was started in 2013 by a Canadian entrepreneur, uh, Chris Pavlovsky. So it was really just a regular um, YouTube clone. You know, it had pictures of dogs and videos of cats and babies, and that's kind of where it was. But something happened in 2020 because Rumble wasn't doing so well. And so in 2020, when we were facing, you know, rampant misinformation about COVID and the election, and YouTube was saying, get off our platform with that and was instituting some um, um, content moderation, Rumble came in and put out a welcome sign and said, please, everybody that was just kicked off those platforms, please come here. And you can really see it in this sweeping sort of about page that Rumble has, where they say, you know, basically, we will not censor you. This is where free speech lives. They say that... Um, they, they're immune to cancel culture. And that stance has really attracted the far right creators and conspiracy theorists to the platform. And when you talk about the user base of the platform, it's something like, as far as we know from the latest figures, 44 million. A lot of people, right? You talk about YouTube, though, billions of users, right? I mean, it's apples and oranges here. How much could a moment like this, right, streaming a moment like the Republican presidential debate, move the needle for Rumble? Yeah, it is really important to say, I'm so glad you did, that it really is a niche niche platform. This is a small amount of people, right? However, um, you know, if you even look at their filings, they're now a publicly traded company as of last year. If you look at their quarterly findings, they are filings, they're actually bleeding monthly active users. So they're about half of what they were this time last year. So they need more than extremists to watch their programming. They need a mainstream audience. And aligning themselves with the GOP might do this. Now, an interesting question, too, is not does Rumble need the GOP, but does the GOP need Rumble? Rumble, right? And mm -hmm. what I think is interesting here is that it's not just a platform. Rumble's actually soliciting donations for the RNC, and they say on their live stream that they'll put your name on a ticker across the bottom of it. So that, um, that says something to me. That's sort of important. Not that it's just some random platform, but that they are partners. And, you know, for their part, at least, the RNC gave a statement to the AP, um, and they said, specifically went to distance themselves, and they said, hate, bigotry, and violence is unfortunately prevalent on every Every social media platform and the RNC condemns it entirely, but the RNC does not manage content or pages outside of our own. 
So that's the RNC. What about Rumble? How have they responded to the criticism about the misinformation and extremism on its platform? For its part, Rumble has said, we have done our part. We take away unlawful content. We take away explicit racism. Um, but, you know, you only have to go on the front page of Rumble to see how welcome misinformation and um, vitriol really is on the platform. Brandy Zudrosny, thank you very much. Be sure to join us for special coverage of that Republican primary debate tomorrow night, 11 o'clock Eastern, hosted by my friend and colleague Kristen Welker. I will see you there. We'll be up watching it. We'll be talking about it afterwards. I'll see you then. I'll also see you a little bit later on this network because that's a wrap for this hour. We've got more coverage picking up right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.